for those of you that don't know me, my name is Brennan Dick. I am a new associate pastor here, um, and it has been an amazing first two weeks. I will tell you, when Shane and Tom came to me and they told me that um, they, they were interested in getting my help with the youth service, my fear was they wanted me to help with the band, and no one wants that. Okay, you don't want me playing an instrument or singing. That is not my gift. And so when Shane said and Tom said, well, no, no, we just want you to speak. I was like, oh, okay, I can do that. I can do that. So what I'd like to do this morning, I'm going to try and keep it short. If anyone knows me well, they know that I like to talk and I can do it really well. And so I'm going to try and keep us to a respectable time so that all of you don't get hungry and start glaring at the back of my head. Um, but I want to share a little bit this morning, a little bit more about my story and what God has done, because he's brought me through a lot, especially over the last five years of my life. And so the, the aptly named title of my sermon this morning is Three Ways God Got My Attention and Three Ways That He Wants to Get Yours. Okay. Now, there's a lot of ways that God can get our attention. I think there's no limit to the way that God can communicate and interact with us. But there's three ways that he definitely got my attention. And I think all of us will encounter these at one point of our lives or another. And so I grew up, I'll give you a little backstory of me. I, I grew up in Calgary. Uh, I have family here. My, my parents live here. My sister and my brother-in-law live here. I have a little niece and nephew. And so I've been born and raised in Calgary. I love it. And when I was growing up, my sister, she was a, she was a pro athlete. She did gymnastics, which meant that she could beat me up until I was in grade 12 because she was twice as strong as I was, um, which kept me humble. It didn't. That's a lie. Um, and she, she was a pro athlete, and so she worked really, really hard, and that's where she invested all her time. I played soccer growing up. That was, that was my sport. I loved playing soccer. But for those of you, and there's a couple of you that know me when I was younger, I didn't grow very much until much later in high school. And so I reached a point in high school, in grade 10, when I had to debate if I wanted to really keep investing in sports or if I wanted to do something else, because I kind of hit a wall competitively. I just couldn't keep up with everyone that was bigger and stronger and faster. And so for me, where I went was church. I started getting really involved and engaged with my youth group and participating as a volunteer and working in that. And that's where I found so much satisfaction. And God had placed a call on my life very early on on a missions trip when I was in grade eight. And he told me very clearly that, Brendan, you're going to work in ministry. You're going to do, you're going to do my work. And I, I had no idea what that meant when I was in grade eight. But as he began revealing that to me throughout my life, I, I started to get a glimpse. I, I graduated high school. And uh, I, I took a year off, and after that, I went to Bible College here in Calgary, uh, Rocky Mountain College, and I started taking a pastoral ministry degree because I still felt this calling on my life that I was supposed to go into ministry. Still had no idea what that looked like, but all right, God, you have my attention, so I'll, I'll go to school. Um, and that was a stretch because I did not like school. But I went, I went to school, and while I was there, uh, I, I grew up in Calgary at Center Street Church, big big church, but when I started going, it was tiny. It was a tiny little church, no bigger than Dalhousie. And to me, that church was home, and a part of it always will be. And when I was working there, I met my ex-wife. We, we got together, and we met, um, got married. She was a pastor. I was going into ministry. And as I was going through school, I ended up getting a job offer, and I worked in kind of the retail sector. I started managing a clothing store. I went on, and I did some pretty cool stuff but through it all, there was a lot of struggle going on in, inside me internally. There was a lot of things that were starting to just gnaw away at me. And through that, God started to get my attention. Now, I'll, t I'll tell you a bit of a story. So when I graduated high school, I took a year off in between going to college and, and graduating. And so I'm 19. I have a couple buddies. Their names are Mike and Chris. And we decided that we wanted to go catch a ball game. We love sports. I'm a big sports fanatic. And so we wanted to catch a ball game. And the closest stadium to Calgary is Seattle. And so we thought, no planning needed. Let's go to Seattle. This sounds like a great idea. It was not. Um, the reason why it wasn't a very good idea was I'm 19, I have a vehicle, I have a driver's license. My friend Chris did not have a driver's license. My friend Mike did not have a driver's license. 
So that meant that I drove all the way to Seattle and all the way back. Now we set out, like I said, this is a kind of spur of the moment trip. We just, we had about a week off. None of us had to work. And so we went to Seattle and we're driving down through Alberta. We're driving down into Montana and crossing the border. And as I reached the border, and I'll, I'll preface this, I knew very little about vehicles, okay? I'm not an automotive guy. And so as I tell this story, who, who knows anything about cars? Any, okay, you are going to just cringe when you hear this story. But I'm driving down to Montana, and all of a sudden, my steering wheel just started shaking, just vibrating a little bit. Now, I will admit I was going, let's just say, above the speed limit, okay? <laughs> above the speed limit. And so I figured, steering wheel shaking, speedometer's a little high, let's just go the speed limit. So now I'm driving the speed limit. We crossed the border over into Montana, and now we're heading across Idaho and into Washington. And the steering wheel starts shaking a little bit more. I went, oh, all right, let's, uh, let's go a little bit slower. So I'm just a little below the speed limit. And I asked my friend Chris, he took automotive all the way through high school, okay? And I asked him, I said, Chris, is this normal? Is this okay? And he's like, ah, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Now, I trusted him. He was my like, closest friend. So your closest friend gives you advice. What are you going to do? You usually listen to it. I took his advice. I didn't worry about it until... Steering wheels start shaking a little bit more. And at this point, I'm only going 80 kilometers an hour on a highway, and there's vehicles just blazing past me, and I can barely keep the wheel straight. And so I, I, tell, I say to him, I'm like, I, I think there's something wrong here. This, this you know, pit in my gut just started just gnawing at me, and I was like, oh, this doesn't feel right. I mean, you don't have a vehicle. You don't have a vehicle. What do you, either of you know about what's going? No, this doesn't, doesn't work. And so we pulled over. I found a little, just one of the little, um, you know, pullouts and parked the car and we got out and my buddy Chris, mechanic, he's like, oh, I'll take a look under the car. So he scooches under the vehicle and he's like, I'll see if anything's going on. And I just started walking around the car, walking around the car and I come to my driver's side door and I look down and I look at my tire and there was just, there is something in, something in me that was like, this isn't right. It was just, just this, this kind of restlessness within me. And I looked at my tire, and I don't know what compelled me, but I walked over, and I kicked it. Now, if you have a car that's parked on flat ground, and you kick a tire, it should not move, right? My tire moved quite a bit. And the reason why was, there was four nuts missing off the tire. There was one left, and so I, le I leaned down, and I could just pull it off. I didn't have to unscrew it. I didn't have to, I just pulled it right off. And all of a sudden I'm looking at my tire and there's nothing holding it to the vehicle anymore. Kind of scared me a little bit realizing how close I came to potentially driving down a mountain road through the Rockies and having a tire fall off my vehicle. Probably not the best thing. And I looked, at, I looked at my buddy Chris, he's, he's still under the vehicle, I can only see half of him, and I said, Chris, you should, you should take a look at this. He's like, uh-huh. And I was like, you should, you should probably take a look at this. So he comes out, we took a bolt off of every other tire and put it on, tightened them, and drove to Seattle and took it to a shop. But that, that event in my life, it was one of those things where I look back and I go, Lord, that happened purely so that I could use it as a sermon illustration. That's the only reason this happened in my life. I have no other reason for this event to have happened except to use it as an illustration because it illustrates a couple things for me. And the first is this. The first way that God has been able to get attention in my life and the way that I think he's going to get yours is through a restless spirit. All right? A restless spirit, that, that, that gnawing inside of you that just starts to grow and burn and develop and, it, and you just you feel it. Something's off. I wonder if you guys have ever felt that, just felt th that restlessness. I felt it. I felt it when I was 24 years old. I am married. I have my dream vehicle. I have a, a job that is paying me near triple figures. And I'm, I'm involved in ministry. And I have everything that I thought I wanted in life. I thought I was set. Everything everyone ever told me about Go for this in life. Go for this. Go for this. I had it all. 
But inside, I was restless. I, I wasn't happy. I had no joy. And I was, I was wrestling with why do I feel this way? We're going to take a look at one of my favorite individuals in the Bible, and that is David. I love David, and I love the Psalms, because the Psalms are just an expression of David's heart. And you can almost kind of track him all the way from the beginning of the Psalms to the end of the Psalms. He kind of goes on a bit of a roller coaster ride. And you can actually see the struggles that he's going through and the outcome of those struggles. We're going to take a look at Psalm 6, 1 to 7. It says this, and it'll be on the screen. It says, O Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your rage. Have compassion on me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony and I am sick at heart. How long, O Lord, until you rescue me? Return, O Lord, and rescue me. Save me because of your unfailing love, for the dead do not remember you. Who can praise you from the grave? I am worn out from sobbing. All night I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it with my tears, and my vision is blurred by grief. My eyes are worn out because of all my enemies. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this, I think David might have a bit of a restless spirit. <laughs> he, he's struggling. He, he, David went through a lot in his life. Right? And what we know about David is, is he was a king that sought after God's heart. But that didn't mean that he didn't have trials or tribulations along the way. He had this feeling inside of him. He, he's saying that his bed has been drenched by weeping. If there is something inside of us and we are crying out to God, that restless spirit is growing within us, I believe that that is God getting our attention. If you feel a restless spirit within you, if you feel that pit in your stomach, my question to you would be this. What is it that God is trying to communicate to you? The second thing, the second way that God has gotten my attention and he wants to get yours is if I go back to my story of, of heading down to Seattle, it's community and relationships. All right? My community, my closest relationships, my friend Mike and Chris, I trust them unequivocally. They were my ride or die. And I took their advice when they said nothing was wrong. They were wrong. Right? But, but they were my community. They were my relationships. Our community, our relationships, the people that we keep closest to us, those are the people that are going to affect our lives. Those are the people that are going to speak into our lives positively or negatively. One way or the other. And I think God is very intentional and very clear that we are to be in community and we are to be in relationship and it is supposed to impact us. I want to take a look at Psalm 133 verse 1. It says this, How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. And I love this. I don't know if you guys know this, about, but there, there's so many times in the Bible where we have, you know, Scripture talking about anointing someone's head with oil. And it was very intentional. You didn't just anoint someone's head for no reason. You anointed it because it was a show of respect. And by anointing someone's head with oil, you actually invited them in to relationship. It was a symbolic gesture that you, this person that you are now anointing is part of your community. Right? And we are, we are told here by David that he sees how precious it is, how wonderful it is when, when community and relationship are in harmony with each other. When our community, when our relationships are able to bless us. Right? I think we can all recognize that we have a deep-rooted desire to be in a relationship. Right? We, we as humans don't do very well isolated. If you've ever spent any amount of time alone, we get lonely, we get, we get distraught. Now, I know a couple introverts in my life, and they would argue that they're okay with that. All right? I live with one of them. But at some point, they still need relationship. Me, I'm a bit more of an extrovert, which doesn't come to a surprise to most people. But there are times when I come home and I just want to hang out with one of my roommates or see one of my friends. Because if I go a period of time by myself, 
it, it takes a toll on my heart. We are to be in community. We are to be in relationship. And the reason why we are to do this is because those are the people that are going to speak into our lives. As I uh, went through the application process and applied to this job, the people that spoke into my life were the ones that I was in community with. The people in my life that I trust and respect the most were the ones that, that encouraged me and prayed with me and journeyed with me. If I had negative influences, if I had people in my life that weren't concerned about my standing with God or what I was doing, what advice would they be giving me? What value would that have? Our community and our relationships, the people that you keep closest to you, are going to make an impact, or they should make an impact in your lives. I, I've, I've gone to so many conferences. I went to Bible college. I'm taking my master's in, in counseling, and so I've gone to more seminars than I think I can actually remember. But some of the, the best conferences I've been to, I, I listened to a speaker once, and he said, uh, everyone, everyone in their life needs three things. They need a teacher, a student, and a friend. You need not only relationships, but you need very intentional relationships. You need someone that can teach you. You need someone that you can teach. And you just need someone as a friend. If I kind of apply a bit of a biblical filter on this, I would say that in our lives, we need a Paul, a Timothy, and a Barnabas. Now, if you don't know what I mean by that, my challenge to you would be look, go to your New Testament when you get home, look at each one of those individuals, and see how they engaged people in relationship. Because I think God uses people that are like Paul to guide us. He uses people like Timothy to help us mature, and he uses people like Barnabas to challenge us. Relationships should have a purpose. The people that we keep in our lives really should not just have an impact, but they should have a profound impact. So my question to you is this, how are you being authentic in your community and relationships? And how are those communities and relationships changing you? The relationships and communities that I kept in my life for so long, as I went through high school and graduated into Bible college, I didn't keep very good relationships. I kept a lot of people at arm's length. I kept them close enough that if I needed them, I could pull them in, but never close enough that I could share what was on my heart. I couldn't share my struggles. I couldn't be authentic. I couldn't be transparent with them. I kept them at arm's length. Do you keep your relationships and your communities at arm's length? And the third thing, final thing is this. The, the last way that I have found that God has communicated and, and interacted with me is failure. Now, as soon as I say the word failure, some of us cringe. We hear the word failure, and we don't like it. If you guys think about it, from, from, I, I guarantee you, from the earliest age that you can remember, failure is something that we are taught to avoid at all costs. We don't like failure in North American society, right? It is first place or no place, right? Failure is something that we don't talk about, we don't acknowledge, and if it occurs, we chastise. And we go, you failed, you failed, is that how God sees failure in our lives? I don't think so. If you think about some of the most profound people in the world, both biblically or, or just culturally, failure isn't something that stopped them. If you think about, I, I, I'm a bit of a history buff, and so I love a, a lot of history stories. And so you take someone like the Wright brothers, you know, those people that discovered flight, flew a plane. They crashed 30 planes before they made it work. All right. Now, I don't know what there is going through their head as they're crashing 30 planes. I don't want to know what was going through their head as they were doing that. But they didn't let failure define their lives. I, I love Disney movies. I'm a sucker for Disney movies. I know Shane is shaking his head at me right now, but that's okay. Uh, I love Disney movies. Walt Disney, he was actually fired from one of his first jobs as a newspaper reporter. And in his biography, which is amazing, he quotes this. He was fired, and on his termination slip, it said he lacked imagination and had no good ideas. Someone fired Walt Disney for not having imagination. All right? Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm Walt Disney, 
like that would sting. I, I get fired, and I, I'm, I, I'm told that I don't have an imagination and good ideas. I might as well pack up and go home. But Walt Disney didn't do that, and we know that. He went on to have one of the most successful companies in the world. He didn't let failure define him. We can look biblically and see so many more examples. You can see Jonah and the whale. You can see Moses running away and avoiding God at all costs. You can see Peter denying that he even knew Christ. We have so many examples of of people that are so instrumental in our scripture that failed. We're reading the Psalms. David failed. He failed miraculously. (laughs) Right? David... David is one of my favorite characters, but because he never stopped seeking God's heart, even in failure, right? He failed. We, we know David committed adultery. We know that he then had the husband of the woman he slept with killed, right? Did you guys know that David actually had two open civil wars during his time as king? Two open revolts in his own kingdom, I don't know about you, but a successful king probably doesn't have civil war on his doorstep once, much less twice, during his reign. David wasn't the best king, but he never stopped seeking God's heart. I was saying earlier, you can kind of track David's progress through this. And there's a couple verses, I'm going to kind of go through them, they're going to be up as well. But Psalm 35, 15, it says this, But they are glad now that I am in trouble. They gleefully join together against me. I am attacked by people I don't even know, and they slander me constantly. David faced a lot of attacks, some of it his own doing. But he experienced failure. Psalm 40, verse 2 says, He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire, and he set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walk along. Psalm 51, 10 Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. Another word for loyal in the scripture there is steadfast. You'll see that in a lot of translations. I don't know about you, but a steadfast spirit sounds like the exact opposite of a restless spirit. If we don't have a restless spirit, we should have a steadfast spirit because God is in relationship with us and we know what it is that he's placed on our lives. David experienced failure firsthand. He went from a forgotten child, a child that his dad didn't even bring him, right, to to be anointed. He went from a forgotten child to an anointed king. Then he was exiled. Then he became a king and a conqueror. Then he had civil war and committed adultery. And then he created a kingdom and a dynasty that lasts for 500 years and is called When we look at Christ, he is referred to as coming from the line of David. That shows an immense connection, right? Immense respect in scripture towards David. But David wasn't perfect. We all lose our way. I think sometimes the opposite of failure is when we're experiencing profound success. Like I told you earlier, I was experiencing profound success in my life. I had no reason to be unhappy. I had no reason But I think sometimes when we are experiencing so much success, we do the same thing with Jesus. We do the same thing with God that we do sometimes with community and relationships. And that's we keep God right here. He's in our peripheral. He's in our side view. We see him. We know he's there. We can talk to him. But he's not front and center. He's not our focus. He's not what we go to first. So what is it that we go to first? What is it that we're, what is it that we're, we're focused on? Because if it's not God, it's something else. Failure should not define us. It didn't define David. It didn't define Peter. It didn't define the Wright brothers or Walt Disney. It should not define us. We shouldn't be afraid to talk about our failure. This was a very hard lesson for me to learn. Because I had a lot of failings. And I had a lot of pride. And it wasn't until God beat me down and had me at the lowest point in my life that he showed me that failure is not something to be afraid of. God can talk to us in our failure. He can show us what's next. If you aren't sure why you failed, that can be almost harder. It's a lot easier. It's been difficult, but it's been easy in the sense that I know why I failed. I can identify the sin in my life. I can look at it and go, okay, I get it. I messed up. 
when we don't know why we failed, that's almost worse. Because we can question it and go, God, why? Why, why haven't I experienced success? Why haven't you blessed me? Why haven't you given me what you say that you've promised? I think that's an even greater opportunity to go, to go to God, to kneel down before him and ask him, why? Why haven't I experienced your blessing? Why haven't I experienced success? God wants us to go to him. And failure can sometimes be a simple reminder that he isn't front and center. And sometimes it can be us recognizing that we have failed and fallen short of the glory of God. I am still figuring all this out. If you talk to any of my roommates, they will be the first ones to tell you that I am still figuring this out. By no means am I a perfect person. And I still sometimes struggle to identify when these things are occurring in my life and what to do when I actually get around to identifying them. But one of the things that I am so steadfast in is that no matter what, I will continue to seek the heart of God. So my challenge for you is that. No matter if it's a restless spirit, no matter if you have a steadfast spirit, if you're in good community in relationships or poor community in relationships, if you're experiencing success or failure, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, we should all still be seeking God's heart. I'm going to pray and the worship team can come up. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for today. God, I want to thank you for this church. I want to thank you for this community that has gifted me an immeasurable gift. God, I want to thank you for the things that you have done in my life and everyone's lives here today. God, you are working in all of our lives, whether we recognize it or not, whether we're willing participants or not. God, I, I pray that you place on our hearts, that you stir up within us a restless spirit so that we are drawn to you. I pray that we find ourselves able to be authentic with the community and relationships around us. And I pray that we would never allow ourselves to be defined by our failures, but allow them to transform us and bring us closer to you. I pray this in your name. Amen.